Proverb 29th chapter, beginning at the 18th verse. This is was supposed to be our vision Sunday. Our vision Sunday. I want to share with you our vision, share with you our mission, and lay clear, set the course for the next couple of years. However, you will not get the vision this week. Because the moment I began to unpack the vision, I realized I had to talk about vision. It's coming. Look at your neighbor tell them it's coming. I promise you. But I felt like I had to talk about vision the moment I began to look into vision, and particularly to deal with a passage that needs some clarification. Proverb 29, verse number 18. When you get there, say, I'm alive. In the King James Version, it reads, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. That was so short and I'm feeling so good, I'm going to read it again. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Right before you take your seats, look at a few people. Tell them, I need a vision. Hallelujah. And you can turn up the house lights. It's okay. The vision. In preparation for this vision week, I begin the process through really the concept of vision. But in the middle of that, the Lord really began to speak in a prominent manner to me about the people that make up this church. While there here are corporate words spoken, it's important to understand that we're only as good as the individuals and the families that prize this, this ministry. And for some of you, I know you, and there may be things that have been dis dis disclosed personally, but others, it's really by revelation. The Lord began to speak concerning where many of you are. And I, I don't know, I didn't get in your business and no one snitched on you. But I suspect there are some things in your life that are out of order. Okay, not on this side, they got it all together. Let me try this side. I suspect that there's some things in your life if we were truthful, that are out of order. I got the real section. I think I'm going to vibe with you over here today. <laughs> and I know it's difficult when we come into church because part of the illusion, you know, you've heard me say this in different contexts, we have to master the art of the illusion that we're all good. We have to look the part. We have to be perceived as holy and on point, walking in the middle of the, the will of the Spirit for our life every single day. But the reality is there's some things in your life, in your families, that have not aligned to the will of God, that, that are out of order. And our God is a God of order. You've heard me share this message, but in a general sense, if you're taking notes, before there is glory or pronounced results, usually God gets things in order. Say order. order. Before the glory, we read this, this passage where the Bible says that the construction of the temple, and we skip right to this part, that the glory of the Lord, Filled the temple. The cloud was so thick in there, the priest could not stand to minister. Glory of the Lord filled the temple. 
But what none of us talk about is the order that the things that were set into place, the things that were set into order before the glory ever came. Before the glory ever came, every curtain, every curtain rod, every material, every measurement was exactly the way God prescribed which came from revelation from heaven. They took the revelation from heaven, they practically worked it out in the earth. When they did that, when they aligned themselves to God's will from heaven, then again the glory came. In fact, when Jesus teaches us to pray, notice the same order. He says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The revelation first starts in heaven, it comes down to earth. When we align ourselves and order things, the glory of God begins to come in prominent ways in our life. Things that weren't working begin to work. Things that weren't aligned begin to become aligned. Relationships that were out of order begin to come into order. Favor that you did not have, things you would have to strive through, work twice as hard for half the results begin to fall in place when the glory of God comes. And that, in a general sense, follows the order of God. We find this in Acts chapter 1. Before we get to Acts chapter 2, verse 1, where we all start, where it says they gathered in one place on one accord, and suddenly there came from heaven tongues of fire that fell upon each of them and they all began to speak in tongues the spirit gave them utterance and then it spilled out the revival into the streets but before it ever spilled out in the streets and the glory of God ever came from heaven they had to get order because there were 11 apostles 11 disciples they needed one because Jesus chose there to be 12 Judas killed himself now there were not 12 there were 11 in prayer they got a revelation that they needed to restore the 12th man. They casted lots, put Matthias in Judas's place. Now they no longer had 11, but 12, the number of order, the number of government. The moment that they had 12, there was order, and then the glory of God came. There are some things we need to put in order in our life. There is an importance to order, but write this down. Order is the byproduct of vision. I cannot put things in order in my life until there is vision. Say vision. I can organize the church or my ministry until there is first vision. I, I cannot get my family in order until there is first vision. We need to have more than just you get out of line, I'm going to beat you. Oh, I got a spirit of conviction hit people in this place because that's how we're going to do it. We're just going to lay hands on you and pray that God takes care of everything. But if you're trying to work your family toward an end result and end goal, there has to be more than the spanking to take them where they're going. There has to be a vision for that family, a vision for your marriage. I know it's going to get quieter. I, I was expecting amens, but it's going to get progressively quieter as we go on. Why? Because there's so much in our lives, our lives, not just your life, our lives. I wish I could step down off of this platform and sit with you while I preach this because I'm with you. There are things in our lives. Look at your neighbor. Tell him, I like that kind of preacher. You know, he that need or require order. But in order to put things in order, I must have a vision. In order to construct a building, you need an architect's blueprint. Are you still here with me? And in order to construct a godly life, a godly family, a godly ministry, I need a blueprint. I need vision. Bible says here in this passage that without a vision, Listen to me, the people perish. Now, I, I want to I work through this a little bit. Can I work it? I'm going to do it anyway. I don't care what you say. <laughs> this, as many passages in the Bible, has been hijacked by corporate America. Yeah, yeah. This passage, when we need a direction, when we want to start a ministry, this passage is quoted, and we as a church have adopted the model of corporate America. Now, there are certain things that work, just don't use this passage to say it. Because this passage we use, we say, before we do anything, we need to draft up ourselves a vision. 
We need to think about what we want to do. We need to think about where we're going to go. We need to come up with a good idea and then align everything to the idea. Now, there is some truth to that, but this is not what this passage is saying. This has been co-opted by the corporate world. But can I give you the original translation or a more accurate translation of what this passage is really saying? It is not saying if you want to go somewhere and ensure that you don't perish, you have to think ahead and create a plan for yourself. Let me give you the translation. The New American Standard Bible is a little bit more accurate. Listen to what it says. It says, where there is no vision, first part's the same, second part's corrected. The people are unrestrained, but happy is he who keeps the law. Now, I want you to get this. Where there is no vision, say vision. It is the word Hazon, H-A-Z-O-N is the transliterated word. It is the word Hazon. Where there is no Hazon, listen to me, the people, it says, will perish, or the people, rather, will become unrestrained. Now, write this down. This is not a message, but it's a preparation for a prayer. I want to pray with you in a moment. But the word Hazon is not a good idea. It is not saying where there is no, no good ideas or no organized thoughts, then people perish. It is not saying simply when you don't have a plan, people perish. But the word for vision here, the word hazan, follow me, is the word that speaks of divine revelation in the form of a vision or a word from God. So it is not that I put a plan together based on all the observable empirical data. It is not that I process through everything I learn in school, put on my type A hat, and put together a nice plan and expect everything to work. When the writer says here that without a vision, a hezon, the people perish. What he's saying is, if there is no divine revelation, if there is no thus saith the Lord, and specifically, this is not in a general sense a random revelation from God, but it speaks of, follow me, hezon, a revelation from God given to a prophetic voice to proclaim what it is that God said. Because he understood that everybody gets good ideas. But he said, if you want order to fall into place, if you want heaven to cash the check that is written by you, you have to make sure that God's signature is on it. There are many of us frustrated in life going through circles because we're expecting for God to cash a check that we wrote. But he says, if you want God to move in your circumstance, if you want glory, then you've got to put things in order, and true order comes from a vision. And true vision is not my idea about how things should go, but true vision comes from heaven to me. True vision is prophetic revelation. So I should read this way. Where there is no prophetic revelation or divine insight, the people become unrestrained. God sent me in this place to instruct someone on how to bring your household back into order. Hallelujah. 
There are things that you've been toiling through because they've been good ideas, but not God ideas. God says there are revelations I want to give you. There is fresh divine insight beyond general information. He said, I want to activate prophetic insight for your house. So you're not just giving your family, giving your husband, giving your children good advice, but you're looking at them and speaking what only the living God is able to reveal. And the truth of the matter, what kept most of us in line was not just a general talk full of principle, but was when you walked in the house and your parent or grandparent just knew that you were up to some rascal business. Your face looked right, but something in their spirit wasn't settled. That was Hazan. God, I wish I had time. Touch somebody, tell them, I pray some Hazan in your life. Yeah, yeah, that's not a corporate America idea. That is divine revelation. If there's one thing the people of God need is they need some divine intervention in their life. I can watch television and get a good idea. I'm not against it, but I can watch a personal empowerment and get some good ideas. Are you with me? I can go to a business conference and get some good ideas. We'll take those, but what needs to undergird it all is a thus saith the Lord. And if there's anything that puts the church back in order and godly families back in order is when God starts speaking to me again. Oh, I came for somebody. You've become functional, but there's been no divine revelation. God, I feel this in my spirit. You've known something's been wrong. You, you don't have the edge that you used to have. You don't have the revelation that you used to have. You don't have the concepts that you know were better than you that you used to have. You used to talk to people and you said, where'd that come from? That wasn't just out of my mind, but it's like the Holy Spirit overrode my intelligence and allowed me to speak words that were beyond my own knowing. Look at your neighbor, tell them, you need some hazan in your life. If there is no divine revelation, things begin to get loose. They begin to get unrestrained. Things begin to fall apart. I know you won't say amen, but there's some things falling apart for some of you in your marriage. Mm-hmm. I ain't scared of y'all. There's some things falling apart with your children. And you feel more impotent than ever before. It's like your words are bouncing off of them like BBs thrown at an iron wall. I don't know who I'm talking to, but God says he's getting ready to give you the revelations. He's getting ready to give you the words. He's getting ready to give you the divine insights that will penetrate again deep into the recesses of people's hearts and bring about the transformation that transforms you. God's getting ready to give you your strength again. He's getting ready to give you your revelation again, but it's not going to come just through just a good book. We'll do that. God says you're going to have to go to the source to get divine revelation. Where there is no divine revelation, the people become, here it is, word is, it says in King James, they perish. The word para. It is not that they perish. That is, a, to me, a faulty translation. As I looked at all these translations and I mean, the, all the words, as I studied this out, it is the furthest thing from what this is saying. The idea of perishing may be the ultimate outcome of what it's saying here, but I think the King James is the only one that translates this in a way that's problematic. It says, where there is no divine revelation, the people, it says in King James, perish. But that word para is not perish. It is that the people are unclothed. They, they are, one translation, they are unclothed. They are uncovered. They are exposed. Don't have time to talk about this. And we have kids in the room, so use your prophetic imagination. They are. Naked. 
If I had time to work this, but this is not my point, I will talk about how we become naked when there is no vision to things we should have been covered from, but we're exposed to all kinds of plots. We're exposed to all kinds of traps. We're exposed to the solicitation of the enemy, and we find ourselves in compromising circumstances. When we're unclothed, we're uncovered. Un unclothed. Un uncovered. It's the picture, if you follow this out, the parallel is the picture when Moses goes up to get divine revelation, he goes up to meet with God on the mountain so the Lord can speak to him. He can take that divine revelation, put it in tangible form on tablets, and bring it back down to the people. But notice this, as their covering is gone. God, I wish it. Let me try this. I thought I had some Bible students. As the one that is covering them goes up to the mountain to get revelation from God, here's what happens. The clothes are off and all kinds of stuff starts to happen. They start to make a God that they can worship. They said, give me all of your jewelry. Are you with me? And they started playing the fool and doing all kinds of things, dishonoring the Lord God by creating a graven image. There is no prophetic revelation. There is no covering. This is not only to the individual, but this speaks within the context of the corporate declaration. While I thank God that every one of us can hear from God, I believe in that, I teach it, wrote, wrote a book on it. But our, uh, there is a corporate declaration, and there are people, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, that God raises up in the body to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. In every local church, there was a senior elder or apostolic voices that had authority over all the other little authorities to declare what thus saith the Lord. That is a covering. And I know we're getting advanced. We're getting beyond that. We don't need that anymore because in the Western world, we all have our own thing and God speaks to all of us but as it relates to the corporate environment there is a thus saith the Lord to the angels that God puts over that place to watch and to guard your soul and to lead and equip you in righteousness are you still here with me there's some of us that have begun to drift Ooh. we become exposed because we've thrown off covering. I don't need to go to church. The Lord speaks to me just like he speaks to them. And some will come to the church. They will take the authority that you give them. And if they don't agree with something that is declared, preached, or proclaimed, well, we all hear from God. That's what they said. But that's not the revelation I have. Hallelujah. And be very careful. They throw a tongue on it to make it seem more spiritual. Eat horrible shit. Where there is no, listen to me, within the corporate context, prophetic declaration, the people be get, become unrestrained. Not just uncovered, but here's the more accurate translation, unrestrained, loosey-goosey. Yeah. Have you ever walked into a ministry that used to move in power, authority, and unity? But can I tell you what? You walk in there and you discern, like, something's going on. It's a little loosey-goosey. You've gone into a Bible study and started seeking the Lord, but now it's more of a drinking party than it is. I'm not, I'm not, I told you I just came back from Napa. I'm not, I'm not more of a drinking party than it is being filled with the Spirit of God and exhorting one another. It's, oh, we don't have to do what they do. We, we got our own thing, a little loosey-goosey. your household because there's been no revelation, not just in the corporate setting, but in the individual setting. There's no revelation for your family. 
Men, you know what it is for things to start to spiral out of control. You know there hasn't been any revelation, no fresh speaking from the Lord in a while. And you looking up and your marriage is getting a little loosey-goosey. You, uh, you used to have eyes for only her. Now you got eyes for everything. <laughs> Ladies, where you used to look and say, even if I disagree, there is a divine order here. I, I give you the respect that you deserve, but it's now gotten a little loosey-goosey. You do you, I do me. <laughs> where there is no revelation, listen to me. The people become, follow me, write this down, number one, unclothed. Number two, the people become, it, it is a picture. Here's the picture. It is the picture of hair that is plaited, that has become unplaited. You let your hair down. Here's the original translation here. It is when you run wild. It is when you're out of control. It is when you're unattended. It is when you are unrestrained. Matthew Henry puts it this way. He says, listen to his translation. Where there is no prophet to expound the law and no priest or Levite to teach the good knowledge of the Lord, the people are unrestrained. Anything goes. This speaks, part A of this passage speaks of revelation. Part B of this passage, notice this, it speaks of the law of God. Notice this. On one hand, there is revelation which speaks of both prophets, follow me, and law. Now, in the New Testament, we understand that God still gives revelation, but we have the full now word of God. It speaks of both spirit and truth. It speaks of the prophetic declaration, the accurate prophetic declaration. The man does not live on bread alone, but every word, not that proceed dead, but that proceed death out of the mouth of the Lord. The, the speaking of God right now, along with Speaking of God now, along with grounding ourselves in the word of God. Now follow me. When we take the business model for this passage, vision is something that is static. It is a snapshot. But here, this passage is not a picture or a snapshot that stays the same forever, that everything is aligned to. But this vision speaks of, follow me, the ongoing speaking, the ongoing revelation, not a snapshot, but an ongoing scene. What is it saying to us? You need to put yourself in a continuous stream. Where the word of God is being, listen to me, not just historically taught, this passage meant this, but where there is, in addition to that, a prophetic insight based on this passage meaning this, and based on where we are corporately in this season of our life, based on where this family is in this season of life, based on the attack or opposition that we are currently in, here is the thus saith the Lord based on where we are. I need the historical understanding, but I also need prophetic insight. We are a congregation that doesn't live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. While we have dreams and intentions, question to you, I'm almost done. How much room have we given for that which originates with God concerning our lives? How much room have we given for, for some of us, there is no vision there is no revelation. There is no divine speaking of God because there is no room. 
no room. We have our ideas. We have our plans. We figured out how our life is going to end up. When God comes in to violate <laughs> or to override that, that there is no room. For some of y'all in this place, and I feel like getting prophetic for a moment, you're married and physically in the same house, but your mind has already moved on. I mean, you, 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 you already in your mind have hooked up with who you're going to connect with after you plan on leaving your spouse. And there's not even any room for God to give revelation concerning where you are right now, for the healing of where you are right now, because you haven't given him room. You have your plan. There is given no room for your destiny. For your God-given, your divine destiny. You have it figured out. You already counting your money. And it'll override everything that gets in the way. And what God really wants to do to you feels like a demotion to you. So you give up your call for your dream. You will sacrifice your destiny. For your ideal, God says for somebody in this place, he wants to restore that which originates with him. And here's what I tell you. Whenever you give room for God to restore that which originates with him and you align yourself to what thus saith the Lord, can I tell you what happens? You get internal fulfillment. You wake up in joy, with joy in the morning. You lay your head on your pillow at night and say, I praise God. You get up the next day saying, this is the day that the Lord has made because he fulfills you in the deepest parts of yourself. But when you decide that you will do that, here's the beauty about God. God will not only fulfill you internally, but God will start to bless you with things that you were expecting externally. Are you with me? There are people that laughed at me when I dropped out and stopped pursuing my dreams to come back to have no position to do ministry with my grandfather. But after a few years, because of my dream, listen, I abandoned my dream for God's intent. I had more than the folks that laughed at me, and I had some joy to go with it. Look at somebody, tell them. Give God some room. Give him some room. Give him some room to operate. You've crowded the ark. That's why before they crossed out of the wilderness into the promised land, God says, get back. Give me some room to operate. Give me some room because if you crowd my presence, if you crowd my ark, you can't see which way to go. How do we crowd the ark? How's it going to happen, God? When's it going to happen, God? What you going to do, God? You're taking too long, God. This is not how I want it to happen, God. This is not the dream I had for my life. God says, will you get back for a second? Because when you crowd me, you can't see me. When you crowd me, you can't get a revelation. When you have it all figured out for yourself, you don't give room for the, the divine speaking that will turn it all around. Elbow your neighbor, tell them, give God some room. Give him, give him some room to speak. Give him some room to operate. Give him some room to flow. And here's what he'll do. He'll do exceedingly. abundantly above all you ask or think according to the power that is at work within you. God says, give me some room. Give me some room. Sit down. Give me some room. Give me some room. Give me some room. There's so much frustration, fatigue, and striving because our motivation, we haven't given God room or motivation for life cannot be competition. Oh, it's getting quiet here. 
I know I'm not messing up somebody's Instagram feed, but it cannot be competition. If you are due performing for competition, then this will not bring fulfillment. He says it is divine revelation. My motivation cannot be competition. My motivation cannot be my pain. My motivation cannot be proving someone wrong who didn't believe in me. My motivation can be making someone uh, something, someone feel that you're worthy. My motivation can be based on where I rank on Instagram or my money. But my motivation must get back to what did God say? What did he say? Let me talk to you. Then we're done. I want you to get these four points, these highlights, then we're done. I want to pray with you. God says, without divine revelation, the people become unrestrained. Without divine revelation, the people become un 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 uncovered. Without divine revelation, the people become loosey goosey. That's the Wayne Cheney translation. But to get here, number one, it requires personal time and intentionality. Can I tell you where your vision started to go from the Lord? Is when the discipline of you gathering in this place consistently and seeking his face personally began to cease. You want to recapture the vision that originates with God and that will change everything? You must get back to the routine. Now, here, here we go. We've made this a curse word, religiously. Listen, religion is not a bad thing. From a biblical standpoint, it's not about religion, it's about relationship. That's not what the Bible says. It is a relational religion. But there are certain things habitually, religiously, we are called to do. There is power the first century church walked in because there are things that they did continually, repetitiously, religiously. That's what it means. The Bible, there is bad religion the Bible reveals, but then the Bible talks about pure and undefiled religion. It talks about good religion. There are things that we've walked away from because we made it personal. We've made it about our feelings. We made it about what we feel like when we get up in the morning, and that's why you've lost your vision. Can I talk to you for real? That's why you've lost your thus saith the Lord. Because there are ebbs and flows in our life. There are seasons of revelation. There are seasons where we walk, we're forced to walk. Sometimes it feels like in darkness. But when I regularly introduce myself into an environment where the prophetic words of the Lord are being spoken corporately, even when I'm in a nighttime season of my life, listen to me, there is bread for me. There is clarity for me. It's interesting. A lot of the counseling I do with people in crisis, as they're struggling to, to get through their challenges, I say, w were you here when I spoke this one? That was just last week. Everything you're talking about right now. We, we just talked about this last week. We're here. Oh, no, I missed that one. Were we here three weeks ago when we, we covered this one? When my, my wife was up here and she did this. I mean, oh, my gosh. Were you here when, 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 when Reverend Dean was up taking the offering and he just, he just, he just, just start to speak prophetically. Did you hear what, what he said? Oh, oh, no, I wasn't there that, that week. What you don't realize is, listen to me, for many of us, we've lost the speaking because we have forsaken the fellowship. But then we've lost the revelation because we have fallen out of the routine of seeking God's face in our individual lives. And sometimes it puts too much pressure on the corporate gathering because you want a miracle worked every week and you haven't done your part. Uh, just, just let me, 
Next time somebody comes up to you, well, it was cool today. It was all right today. The first thing you say before you give them your opinion about how a worship service went, ask them, how's your personal life <laughs> with God? How, how's your devotion? Because here's what I found when, when my devotion's on point. When me seeking God's face and studying his word and crying out to him is happening in my personal life, I go into environments, and you've heard this before, and I'm not the thermometer gauging how hot or how cold it was, how moved or not I was, but I am a thermostat. When I walk in, if it wasn't cracking when I got in there, my whole row is lit by the time I finish. Why? Because I came in full, not looking to be filled on a regular basis. I came in spilling out on people. The joy I had was contagious. Why? Because if you want to reclaim the vision requires personal time and intention. He reminds you there, listen to me, he reminds you in the secret place, in that place, he reminds you, number one, of who you are. It is in that place of devotion with God that you remind, he renews your confidence it, where he continually establishes and reestablishes your identity in him. And it's where he lets you know that all things are possible. And it's in the corporate gathering often that God will speak something through. In this passage, you spoke of prophetic voices in your life, whether it's from this platform or whether it's from the trusted folks that are connected to this ministry. It may not be here, maybe in the parking lot, but it's where prophetic word is spoken into your life. Prophetic declaration in the context of commu community is how it happened for the church biblically. Almost done, number three. It requires time in God's word again. One of the best ways to familiarize yourself with the personal and corporate visions from the Lord is to study the captured vision of the Lord. God is still speaking the same way he's been speaking as he came upon those who wrote the Holy Scriptures. But the captured word of God shows you what's consistent with the corporate and personal speaking of the Lord to us. Last one, listen to me, hear me. The moment that you say, God, I'm, I'm ceasing from striving. I'm ceasing from doing my own thing. My motivation will not be fear. My motivation will not be a sense of irrelevance. My motivation will not be if whether I'm falling behind on social media or not. Listen to me. God says, I need some folks that will go back into that secret place. A place where intimacy was restored with me, where there's room created. The Bible says that in the day of Samuel, you heard me, the speaking of the Lord, visions were infrequent. And the word of the Lord was rare. But in the middle of this, 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 this void of the divine revelation or declaration. The word of the Lord, the Bible says, came to the prophet Samuel. The two things he was doing, the Bible says, before it did, he was ministering in the temple of the Lord before the presence of the Lord. There's somebody in this place, God says he's going to start speaking again. He's going to give you the vision that's going to begin to change everything. But he says, he said, you've got to get into my presence and, and worship me. Not just corporately, he said, but you've got to get back to a place where you find time to minister to my spirit, to minister before me, to, to lift me up, to, to tell me how good I am, how, how wonderful I've been. Not because I need it, but because you need to remember of how worthy I am and what you've done and the, the ways I've made and the doors that were opened and the surpassing greatness of God, how marvelous he is. The Bible said he was ministering before the Lord. But then the Bible says while he was in his place, say his place, in his place in the temple, his place, most scholars believe, there were chambers in the temple, individual chambers where the priests would sleep. 
It was after the flame almost went out. It was early in the morning, and in his individual place, as he had been communing with God, he is now in his place. He, he is in his personal place. His, his personal place. His personal place. He is in his intimate place. He is intimate place. He is in his intimate place. Everybody's gone to bed. Everyone's gone to sleep. There's no praise team singing. There's no band playing. There's no praise partners or prayer partners there to encourage him. But he's by himself in his secret place because God will begin to restore speaking when there's been no speaking if I could get back into that intimate place with him. And it's there in the intimate place that the Spirit of the Lord calls his name Samuel. 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 And God says to somebody in this place, if you can get back to that secret place, that's why there's been so much confusion. That's why there's been so much distraction. That's why right before you get there, somebody comes in with an attitude or with an interruption or with a need. God says you have to be aggressive. You have to fight sometimes for that secret place because the enemy knows if you could ever get back there, God, I'm I don't know who I'm talking to, but the enemy knows if you could ever get back there, God will use you to push back the powers of darkness. If you could ever get back there, your revelation will be restored. If you could ever get back there, the sense of who you are will overcome you again. If you could ever get back to your secret place, your gift of prophecy will be stirred. Your gift of healing will be released. Your declaration of boldness will come over you. If you could ever get back there. That's why you have to fight to get to your secret place because it's in your secret place that God will begin to give you fresh revelation. Look at somebody. So God has something fresh for you. He has something fresh for you. You wait for him to resurrect and to do something with the dream that you have. God says in your secret place, I'll give you things that make the previous dream pale in comparison. I'm not resurrecting that. I'm giving you something new. I'm giving you something better. I'm releasing something greater. Greater, greater, greater. Greater, 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 greater. I declare, I declare in this house that the spirit of the living God is getting ready to give you, release to you things that you haven't even dreamed about yet. That the Spirit of the Lord will do exceedingly and abundantly above all you're able to ask or even think. Touch somebody. Tell them God is getting ready to give you something you haven't even thought about. He's getting ready to give you revelation that you didn't even know existed. I don't know who I'm talking to, but God says to somebody, I'm not restoring what you were expecting. God, I feel this. God says, I'm not restoring what you're expecting. He said, I'm superseding what you were waiting for. I'm going to give you something that's going to blow your mind. I'm going to give you, the, you wanted the city, and I'm going to give you the nation. You wanted the family, and I'm going to give you generations. You wanted a house, and I'm going to make you a blessing to your family and to your children. Children, touch somebody. So God is going to exceed. God is going to exceed. Hallelujah. 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 Listen, listen. Listen, we got to go. The Lord says in Habakkuk 2 3, He said, Though Though the vision carries, he says, though the vision lingers. In other words, though the vision, though the answer, though the divine revelation takes its time coming to you, 
though the vision lingers, wait on it. Touch somebody and wait on it, wait on it, wait on it. Don't get impatient. Don't try to make it happen. Don't go do something else. But no, the vision lingers. Wait on it. For it shall surely come. Tell somebody, it's coming. 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 But wait. 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 I say wait. On the Lord. For he who waits on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall walk and not get weary. They shall run and not fight. from him I know that if I get a revelation from him all my strength will be renewed I know if I get a revelation for him I can run the next leg of the race and God says he's going to give you somebody in this place a second wind and if that's you I need you to make your way to this altar come on right now I got to lay hands on somebody I got to lay hands God says God says Revelation is coming. Revelation, come on, lift your voices. 
Lift your voice, you're all fun.
voice and sing it. Let's come on. We give you all.